Hey, I'm Nate. Doesn't it make you sad that's the last one you're going to see of those? It does. Now there's all this other information we're not going to know. It just, it depresses me. Hey, um, first off, I want to thank everyone. Uh, we kind of had a church work day yesterday. I want to thank everyone so much who showed up and came out because this place looks great. It is fantastic. And um, just thank you so much for taking your time to do that. And uh, this is an exciting Sunday. Um, I don't know how many of you have realized this. Some of you have. Over the last year, we have been working our way through the book of Matthew. How many of you were at least consciously aware of that? The rest of you are like, wow, I thought we were talking about Matthew a lot. That felt odd. And today is the last Sunday in the book of Matthew. And I could not be more excited. <laughs> so it has been, because like prepping up stuff, I'm just like, oh, Matthew again? So we're probably not going to talk about Jesus for a year. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Don't worry. <laughs> so um, this is the last week of our series, Prepper's Guide to the End of the World. And this whole series starts on this simple question of what is going to happen? What do we need to know? What do we need to be aware of when it comes to the end of the world? This is a question that you have probably thought of at some point in time. End of the world. What do, what do I need to know? And what we actually have is we have an account of Jesus' closest followers asking Jesus this question. And so we don't have to wonder what Jesus said. We know exactly because they went to him. And we don't, we don't know what specifically motivated them in that moment. We don't know if they were going, but does, it, does it feel hotter? Yeah, I th- Do you think it's just continuously getting hotter over time so that we are no longer to be able to sustain life on earth? Let's ask Jesus what's going to happen at the end of the world. So that could have been it. Or they're like, do you think a meteor is going to hit? I don't know. We should ask Jesus what's going to happen. And Peter looked at Paul and he said, do you think there's going to be a zombie uprising so much that we're going to have to go to a guy, flee from Atlanta, and then go to Herschel's farm for an entire season until everyone gets bored and a bunch of people quit following us, so then we have to up the violence in the next seasons to draw viewers back? I don't think that's actually how it happened, to be clear. But they ask Jesus, they go, hey, what do we need to know about the end of the world? And this is what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't go, well, get out your notebook, okay? I've got a list for you of things you're going to want to be mindful of. And he doesn't give them a date. He doesn't go, well, August 3rd, 2016. Watch out for that one. No, he, he doesn't do any of those things that we usually equate with discussions on the end of the world. Instead, he tells them three stories. And these three stories are all combined. Um, In each week of this series, we have looked at a different story. And today we are going to look at this third story. But to catch you up or to refresh this or to have this be new information, if this is your first Sunday with us, I want to tell you real quickly what the first two stories are. So the first story that Jesus tells is he tells a story about people preparing for a wedding and people waiting to go to a wedding reception and how some people didn't make the proper preparations to go to the wedding reception. And so they were excluded from the party. And we use that story to make this point that a lot of times when we talk about Bible prophecy or things that refer to the end of the world, we usually assume that what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to come up with a date, that we're supposed to have a calendar that's like, well, the end of the world must happen here. And we said instead what Jesus is pointing to is we should view it like a March Madness bracket, that when you fill out the bracket, it helps you be more attentive to games and to things that you normally wouldn't care about as much. And that that is the reason why Jesus gave Bible prophecy, is because it would be so easy for our relationship with God and our faith to take second or third or fourth or 50th place in our lives. But when we're aware that Jesus is going to return and conscious of the fact that we don't know when that is going to happen, it helps faith maintain its position of priority in our entire lives. And so that's the first story. And then he moves on to the second story, and he tells a story about a master who gives some of his servants different amounts of money, and then he goes off on a journey, and he comes back and he asks, hey, what'd you do with my money? And the first one goes, hey, I doubled it. And the second one goes, hey, I doubled mine too. And then he looks at the third one. Third one goes, I was scared, so I hid it in the ground. Here it is. And what Jesus does, who takes the role of the master in the story, is he takes it and he gives it to the one who has the most And then he basically curses that servant and tells him to get out. And so we said that story points to this fact that you have a phenomenal opportunity to do good. That the way that it looks like for you to be spiritually attentive and spiritually ready is that you would take the gifts, the abilities, and the time that has been given to you on this earth to do good. That you would not waste them and that you would not simply use it on yourself, but that you would use it to do good. So with that setting, so he said... We should be ready. The exact words Jesus uses is we should keep watch. And then he says, we have an opportunity to do good. And then this is what I love. In this last story Jesus tells, 
is he shows us what it looks like for us to do good. So if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to be looking at verses 31 through 46 throughout this. And this is a story about sheep and goats, if you couldn't tell by the lovely picture. I like the picture. I think they're dancing. So Matthew 25, starting in verse 31, and it says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, important distinction, this is what the disciples are asking. They're saying, hey, Jesus, we know you're going to return and establish your kingdom. So Jesus says, when the Son of Man, meaning himself, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. This is not like corporate political structures. This is He's saying all people, every individual will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, this was a common practice. Um, What would happen is sheep and goats, they would kind of mingle together. They would graze together. And then at night, what the shepherd would do is they would go and they'd separate them. And often it was because goats would get colder at night. So we would kind of go through and take the goats out of the pack and put them in a spot inside or somewhere where they could keep warm. But this group that had once grazed together, all of a sudden would be separated. Now, I think this is really important for us to acknowledge, is that Jesus often tells stories using animals in Scripture. And he usually uses three different animals. He uses sheep, he uses goats, and does anyone know what the third one is? This is risky. Oh, talking in church, this is so scary. I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer, don't worry. Wolves, sheep, goats, and wolves. Now, this is the important distinction. Sheep and goats grazed together, but sheep were preferable to goats. Do you like the picture? It makes me laugh. (laughs) Um, Wolves were enemies of God, okay? So wolves are the people, normally when he speaks to them, are the people who are like, whether they're usually conscious of it, but who are against God and trying to work against what he's doing. Sheep and goats are kind of doing their thing over here, and wolves are constantly trying to lead them astray. Now, this is so significant, because when Jesus starts this story, he's telling it to his closest followers, and he gives the description of sheep and goats, and he's talking to them. And so he's saying that there's going to be a group of people that are going to hang out together, that are going to look similar, that are all going to maybe confess the same things, that are all going to maybe say the same things, they're all going to maybe do some of the similar things, but there will be a time when they will be separated. I mean, if we can put it in context today, it's kind of like he, he's not out on the street corner shouting this. It's like he's giving this message in church. He's going, there's sheep and there's goats. And there's going to be one day that they're going to be separated. And he uses that whole thing. He leaves it behind now, but he uses that whole thing to make this simple point. that There are going to be people who claim to follow me, who look like they follow me, who don't actually follow me. And I want to show you the distinction. So this is what he says after that. This is verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, so these are the sheep, the position of influence, the position of honor. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then this next phrase, what he's going to say, he's going to repeat this four different times in the passage because he's trying to emphasize it. He says, for you since the creation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. It says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? I I love the response. They're surprised. I think that speaks volumes. Is they're shocked. He goes, you are blessed because you did this. And they're like, wait a second, we did that? I don't remember doing that. 
And, and what that speaks to the fact is they weren't doing these actions for a reward. Like, there's no part in Scripture where Jesus goes before that of going, he, he's not alluding to the fact that he would have gone, hey, uh, you do this, and then you'll be blessed in this way. And so they went, okay, I need to do this, so God will bless me this way. They just did it. It was natural for them. It's just how they live their lives. And he goes, you're blessed because you did it to me. And they go, we don't remember doing this to you. And then he responds with this. It says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Yeah, you didn't do it directly to me, but whatever you did for one of the least of these, now, sometimes people want to like, define that. What is the least of these? Well, I, it's the group of people who you've written off. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a set thing for each one of us, but it's, it's the people, the person that you've written off, that you've maybe made excuses for their actions, defined behaviors in a certain way, and, and somehow gotten yourself to the point that you've convinced yourself that they don't really matter. It's the people who are struggling, the people who are needy, who you are blind to, or who you are intentionally ignoring. And he says, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. And then the passage continues. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And it says, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? I, I love this response. They go, whoa, 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 hang on a second. We would have helped you. <laughs> like, Jesus... Like, if you were thirsty, I would have gotten you a drink. I would have gotten you a big gulp, like not just a small one. I'd gotten you the whole thing. Make sure you were fine for days. They're like, we don't remember ever seeing you in these positions. And then he responds. It says, he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the right to eternal life. This is one of those uplifting passages, right? It just makes you feel all good and warm inside. And the disciples went away, like, man, Jesus is the best. He just tells things that make me feel good about myself. Now, this is, this is really hard. And so the question comes, what do you do with this? Like, what do you do with this teaching? Th this is what I've heard people attempt to do is they've attempted to explain it away so for some reason we don't have to take action on it. And they'll be like, well, the goats refer to people born before 1900, and the sheep are everyone after that. And because of this, and just changing the verbs from Greek to modern-day English, basically it means we have excuses not to ever help anybody. There we go. No, we can't do that, because that's not what it says. It says very clearly, this is what we're supposed to do. So what do you do with that? Does it say that your responsibility is to sell your possessions and spend your life serving those who are in the most need? Maybe. It doesn't not say that. So maybe. But this is a really hard thing. Anytime you get into stuff like this, the Bible, if I can be clear, it is confusing. It is confusing on specifying what actions we are supposed to take and what we are specifically called to do. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, we see a story of a guy by the name of the rich young ruler. This is how he's known. This is not a parable. This is a literal thing that happens. So this man who is identified as the rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, keep the commands. And then he lists some of them. The rich young ruler is thrilled because he knows he's kept in. So he goes, all these I have kept since I was a youth, which I think is a funny way of identifying himself. Since I was a youth, he's kind of patting himself on the back. All right, I'm good. He thinks I'm good to go. And then Jesus says, yes, you have, but one thing you still lack, sell all your possessions you have and give them to the poor and then come and follow me and you will have life for eternity. And it says the man walks away sad because he had many possessions. 
And so we have that account where Jesus actually does tell someone to sell everything, but then we have other accounts that are very, very different. We have a guy who's famously known as the Ethiopian eunuch. He is more so likely a treasurer in the kingdom. And so he has a position of power where he's handling money. He has his own chariot. So that's like he has his own Lamborghini, okay? So he is wealthy. He is well off. He's reading scriptures one day. A man comes up, explains it to him. He immediately converts, follows Christ, is baptized in that moment. And no one ever says anything to him about what he should do with his possessions, like, that's where our story, account of him ends. No one ever says, hey, and you might want to sell the chariot and help people. That doesn't happen. He's never given that description. We see a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea who is wealthy. He has his own tomb. This is a big deal. He had his own personal tomb. He's still alive, okay? He prepared in advance. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, he gives his tomb to Jesus. And nothing is ever said about what he should do with the rest of his money. We see a lady by the name of Lydia, who is the patron of the very first church in Europe. Most of the first century churches, they met in courtyards or in other existing buildings. Lydia was so rich that the church in Europe met in her home. And nothing's ever said about what she should do with her money. And you could argue, well, yeah, they're doing something, but Lydia could have sold her house and helped so many more people in the process. So why do we have this picture of Jesus says some incredibly hard things, and then to some individuals, he says some incredibly hard things of what they're supposed to do, and then to other people, it almost seems like he lets them off and just goes, yeah, you keep going. This is hard. What do you do with that? And so this is what I want to do, is I want to deal with this passage in terms of the theological, the beliefs part, and then I want to talk about the application and how we live, okay? So I just want to deal with the head part first and try to make some sense of it and how it fits with the rest of Scripture. And then I want to actually talk about what do we need to do with this. So the theological head part first. If you look at the passage of the sheep and the goats, it seems to ask this question. Are we saved by works? Do our actions qualify us before a perfect God? And here's the thing. If this is the only account you had of Jesus speaking, your answer would be yes. Like, well, yeah. I mean, that's very clear. He said, hey, you guys are blessed because you did this. You guys are cursed because you didn't do it. And so we would think what we do is what qualifies us before God. But this is an incredibly important thing. We cannot form belief systems on one account. Because many things are said about God in Scripture, and so we need to see how they all tie together. And when we look at the rest of Scripture, we begin to find the actual place of this story. And so to address this question, I want to look at a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul, who was a leader in the first century church. And what he did is he went around and he planted different churches in all these different cities. And then I love this, he sent letters back to them. And so he'd like plan a church, he'd move on, and then words would come to him and it'd be like, oh yeah, well they believe this and they're doing this wrong and they're doing this wrong. And he'd be like, okay, I'm going to send them a letter. Some churches he had to send a bunch of letters. He'd, okay, I'll send them another letter to kind of correct all the things that they were doing wrong. And so this is one of the accounts that we have from his letters. He says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, to explain this, we need to look at the three key words. Grace, saved, and faith. I want to talk about saved first. What does it mean to be saved? Biblically, what it teaches us is that to be saved is you are spared from an eternity without God. In the more common language, what people say, well, to be saved means you don't go to hell. You go, well, why is hell bad? Well, because hell is hot. And we don't like it hot, right? Amen. You've spent some time in the lobby. Like, we understand this. That's why. It's all a metaphor for Sunday morning. You don't want to be in the lobby. You want to be in God's house where there's AC. That was good. <laughs> I like what happened there. So, um, so that's what usually we get. Like, hell is hot. If I'm honest, I think the biblical descriptions of hell being hot, I think most of them are metaphors. Now, it's okay if it's true. But, but I think the more proper understanding of what hell is, is hell is the one place in the entire universe, in the entire created world, entire everything that exists, that God is not there. And so because of that fact, hell by its very nature is a place without beauty, 
without hope, without goodness, without love. That, that what we see is while we're here on this earth, we get a glimpse of what perfect communion with God is like. We get a glimpse, um, it's referred to in scripture as seen through a mere dimly, that we just kind of get a taste of what it's like to actually be with God. Heaven is when we have a perfect relationship with God, so we get to see him and experience him exactly for who he is and see all the goodness that is there. And so hell, what it actually is, it is the one place that God has completely withdrawn from, and that is what makes it so terrible. And so the nature of being saved is that you are spared from eternity without God, and you get to spend eternity fully knowing him. Now, you do have to spend some time here in this kind of jumbled existence as to what is God? What does he really look like? We can't really know because sin has so entered our world. But then it is one day we will get to be in perfect communication and in perfect relationship with God. So that's what it means to be saved. And then it says that we are saved through faith. We're saved through faith. Now, that faith is in a couple different things. It's an understanding that there is a God, that I have rebelled against him. Because you have. And I have. I have rebelled against him. To make atonement, to make amends for that rebellion, God sent his son Jesus to be a sacrifice for our sins. And that if I will turn the biblical word is repent, which simply means to turn and follow God, then I'm saved. So, so that's faith. There is a God. I have rebelled against him. He sent his son to right that wrong. And if I accept him as Lord of my life, then I will be saved and I will be put on, back on a path to have a relationship with God. Now, the language that Paul uses is perfect here because he doesn't say you have been saved by faith. No, no. He says, you have been saved through faith, for it is by grace you have been saved. Because if you look at it like this, you go, okay, perfect relationship with God, that he would send his son to die for my sins, and all I have to do is believe in him? That doesn't sound like an equivalent exchange, does it? Like, this is not a fair deal. And it's because it's not by faith we've been saved, it's by grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's what he bestows upon you that you do not deserve. Because I need to be really clear here. You do not deserve to be saved. And every single one of us, we fall into this trap that's so common in Christianity. And it's like, yeah, we've been saved by grace through faith. It's all God. But then we believe the side thing over here, like, yeah, but I'm pretty savable, Right? Like, God would want to save me. Like, I'm not calling anything, but if God's on a boat and there's 12 of us drowning in the sea and there's only 10 life jackets, I'm getting one. Like, Jesus is that he may throw me the first one because I'm pretty savable, aren't I? He goes, no. No, no, it, it's God's unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to deserve it. And this is how I imagine it happened. And so this letter, when it was sent to the church in Ephesus, it was read aloud and I imagine like he's kind of going through and he goes, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. I imagine there's someone there like, yeah, but, but isn't it all the good things we do? Isn't it the fact that we go serve and help and I gave a little money and I did this? Don't those account for anything? And I imagine Paul anticipated that. And so this is the next line. He goes, not by works. Like you can just kind of hear the rebuttal coming up. And then he says very clearly, hey, not by works, so that no one can boast, so that you would know abundantly clear, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about God. Your life, your ministry, your good deeds, your salvation, it's not about you. It's about God. So, so with that said, what role does this story play in our lives? If it is so abundantly clearly stated that we have been saved by grace through faith, then why would Jesus make such a big point about whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me, and whatever you did not do, you do not do for me? And the best way I can understand this is through swimming pools. Now, my family... Um, we love to swim. Like, that's what we do all summer. We swim. 
And um, I really believe, as I hope many of you believe, that the pool is meant for games. And somewhere we got this idea along the way that as soon as you become an adult, that you're supposed to just sit in a pool. And that's what bathtubs are for, okay? Pools are for games. That's why they are larger. And so we play games. Um, we do tricks off the diving board, and off the side. I like to throw my girls up as high as I possibly can until all the moms around the pool get really nervous, and then I try to throw them a little higher. Um, sometimes I drop them, but there's water, so we're okay, okay? Everything's good. And so uh, we do those kind of things. My favorite pool game, I don't know if any of you play this. I'm kind of saying this out here because I'm looking for friends to play this game with in the future where you throw the ball in off the side and you devise an elaborate scheme of the, where the ball goes. So it's like, I'm going to be on the ladder. I'm going to throw it to you off of this side. You're going to throw it to him as he's jumping off of this side. You're going to throw it to him coming off the edge, to him off the diving board, to him coming down the slide, to your mom up on the steps. And then your mom's going to throw it back to me because I've gotten out of the pool and come back in and we'll catch it. It's awesome. And then like an hour and a half in, we're just like, is this impossible? No, we're going to do it. And then when we finally get it three or four hours later, we go, we did it. Okay, let's go home. Because <laughs> there's no real celebration with that. So we, we love to swim. And I am fairly uh, non-discriminatory in the pools that I will swim in. Meaning like your pool doesn't really have to be clean. I'm still good. Like I'm fine. Like, like what is this? Is this green? Okay, I can do green. I draw the line at yellow. Yeah. Your little kiddie pools with your faint hint of yellow. I'm staying out of that one. I draw the line at green. So, like, we, we don't really care that much. And some people, they're, like, really meticulous about how they clean their pool. And they, like, get the strips out. And they're so careful. Other people, you kind of, is it green? Okay, let's pour some chlorine. Yeah, that's about right. Throw a kid in. Does it burn? Okay, I guess we're good. Everybody get in. And so, like, we don't, we don't really care. And um, growing up, my next-door neighbor, he had a pool, and it was awesome. He was a high school science teacher. And so, like, that pool was crystal clear. That pool was clearer than our drinking water. Like, it was incredible. And he'd go out every morning, and he had his strips, and so he's checking chlorine level and the pH level and all this other stuff. And he was so careful about it. He wouldn't let us get in the pool until it was perfect. It's like, well, your body composition is going to change the pH level of the pool, so, so I need to get it right first, otherwise it's going to be not clear. I was like, okay, this is great. And so he would do this over and over again. And the thing that I didn't realize, because I had never seen someone like properly care for their pool before, and I was young, is that I thought his little strips are what made the pool clear. Because he always walked around with these things, and he pulled it okay, we're good. I was like, okay, well, that's great. You just put the little strip in and everything's good to go. I, I didn't realize that the strips, that all they did is they told him what was going on within the pool. And I think that's the purpose of works, is that works do not save us. Works reveal what is going on within us. This is such an important distinction. Your good deeds do not save you. They have no power to save you. But what happens is, is that when God enters someone's life, we believe what happens is that eventually he will so radically get hold of their heart that it'll change their motivations, it'll change their desires, and as a result, it will change their actions. And so when God actually grips hold of your heart and begins to become Lord of your life, it will eventually make its way out into how you functionally and practically live your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my favorite author, C.S. Lewis, he said it like this, if someone is converted and there is no change to his outward life, I think his conversion was imaginary. I love that. He says, if someone claims to follow Christ, but there is in no way, shape, or form any tangible change in how they lived, then nothing probably happened. Now, it doesn't save them, but it reveals what is happening within them. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with this whole passage? And this is what I've seen happen. Is I've seen Christians fall into the trap when it comes to this whole works and good deeds and least of these thing, then what we do is we get up on our soapbox. And when we get up on our soapbox, we spout off our opinions and we give fantastic reasons for why we should do nothing. And we get really good at this. 
We have elaborate reasons for why we excuse ourselves from helping anyone in points of need. And this is what happens, and this is what's so crazy to me, is for some reason we always turn these conversations into this global thing that becomes incredibly political. And there's like a simple need right before us, someone who needs help. And we've got to, instead of helping them, we talk about the social injustices of the entire world. It doesn't have to be like that. I read this thing the other day. We live in an age where everyone has an opinion on what is wrong with the justice of the world, yet no one can sew a button. I thought that was very well stated. Everyone has a cure. Everyone has a cure for what is wrong with the entire global world. Could we maybe rest in this, that maybe it's a little more complicated than we think? Maybe it is. And that our role in this moment, if I could say it like this, is not to be Amazon, the company, not the river. Okay? We, we don't have to go over global domination when it comes to social injustice. Instead of being Amazon, we are more so called to be like the corner bookstore who forms relationships with a variety of people and helps them at their point of need. That is what we are called to be. If we have an opportunity to cure big problems, let's do that. But what Jesus initially calls us to in the moment when he says least of these, he's not referring to the entire world. He's referring to the people who they could help who was right there in front of them. And that could we create a place where this conversation wasn't political, where we didn't have to give a party line back and forth and assume that any time we were talking about helping people, it was a conservative or liberal issue? Could we create a place where we could have a conversation simply saying this, that people matter? And that we should do something? Like, is that okay that we could actually do that? That someone could say, hey, I think people matter. And I think some of these things that are going on in the world are wrong. And I would like to try to help it without feeling like people were attacking them constantly for their methods. And that's what Jesus is pointing to here. He's saying, hey, we should be able to rest in this. All people matter. They do. No one deserves to be written off. No one deserves to be completely gone. Let me give you an example of this. So um, I have someone who I am extremely close to who um, committed a socially unacceptable sin. And, and you know how that is. All sins are equal in the eyes of God, but they certainly aren't in the court of public opinion, right? He committed a socially unacceptable sin. And uh, he was kicked out of his church. Um, he lost all his friends. And so uh, we went back and we visited the family and we talked with him. And uh, his dad said at one point in time, he said, you know, the response has been breathtaking. In the sense that some of the people you thought were going to be there have not said a word. He said, but the interesting thing about it is everyone has, the people who have texted, it's always been yeah, whatever you need, whatever you need. We're here, whatever you need. And he said, but you guys are the only ones who are willing to get in a car and come. And I thought, how ridiculous is this? That we would be in a spot that someone was hurting, someone was in need. And, and I think sometimes we make this way too complicated. And it's, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say in this moment. I don't know how to respond. And we don't know how to do everything. And so as a response, we do absolutely nothing. Jesus doesn't call you to cure all the problems in the world, but that is not an excuse for not ever doing something. And so this is what we're attempting to do as a church. And I think it's starting to work. Is we're attempting to create a place where people can be connected to the one who gives life. Where they can clearly come in week after week after week and understand that there is a God who created them, who loves them, and who desperately wants a relationship with them. And as we begin to follow him, that our hearts would be transformed. That at some point in time, Jesus would get such a vice grip on our emotions and our desires and our urges that we would understand that he is the one that we have been desperately looking for. And that as that happens, that our external world begins to change naturally. Naturally just as a response. And what we're trying to do within that is as people have desires and as people want to move on different things, we're attempting to launch them into the community. 
and saying, hey, we, we can't take hold of this. This is your thing. This is your vision. You're the one who sees the need, but we'll do everything we can to resource you and support you. And so as um, Steph and Renee talked in the welcome, we talked about these four projects that we're doing of helping with literacy, helping with families in need, helping with the car care ministry. <laughs> what we're attempting to do, some of these were ridiculous. We came up here and we said, hey, here's a need. We don't know what to do, and we don't have anyone in charge of it. Who's willing to help? And the amazing thing is a number of you showed up and you said, I want to be a part of that. I want to help that. That is God's kingdom coming into action. That is the people of God operating as we were always intended to. And something that we've said a thousand times before as a church is we said, you don't need our permission to be a Christian. And I think so often we get stuck in this mode that is, well, I see a need, and so I need to just go tell someone in the church about it so they can take care of it. And we had an example of this. Um, my wife, Bethany, she, uh, she heard about someone who's connected to our community who, because of medical procedures, was no longer going to be able to pay her bills. And the first thought was, what do we do? What do we do about this? We should announce it. We should do something. And then we remember, wait a second. We are the church. Just as individuals, we are the church. And so we called a couple people. We texted a few others. We let them know the need. And within a day, we had enough money to help pay her bills and utilities for months so that she would be fine. And that's what the church is always meant to look like. That you don't, you don't have to do everything. Let me, let me make it very clear. You are not able to do everything. You are not able to solve the problems of the entire world. But you can solve the problems in one person's world. You can help make someone's life a little better. And in so doing, show them how incredible and how wonderful your Savior is. That we would rest in this. That we are saved by grace that we are saved by grace and that overwhelming love that God distributes to us would not simply be able to be held by us because it was so overwhelming, but that it would make its way into the way that we lived our lives and related with others. So let us be a people. Let us be a people who show the love of God working in us. Let me pray for us. Father, of all the things I know, if I know this, you are good. You are good. And I don't understand. I cannot fathom within me, and I've had it explained a hundred times, why you would send your son for us. Why, as scripture tells us, that if there were just one of us on earth, that you would have sent your son to die for an individual. And it amazes me, and it blows me away. But I am grateful. I am so grateful. And so, Lord, my prayer is this, is that as a people, as a community, that we would experience your love that we would understand the depth and the width and the riches of what it is like to be in a relationship with you, that we would understand how horrific life would be if you would pull out, how horrific life would be if you would all of a sudden be deliberately absent. But instead, we could rest in knowing that we have a Savior who loves us and who is good, and that that would make its way into how we lived in every aspect of our lives. Let us be that kind of people. Amen.